since I exist as a result of out of the body gestation plus was designed by specialists plus technicians with massive solar sources. My destination is here in the telehumans colonies of species survival in Cell City. Quasi-humans here reside in special life support suits specifically designed for purposes of continuous protection from most external dangers. Telemedical facilities are built in so that bodily functions are safeguarded against the obsolete accident of death. Residents here at Cell City self-regenerate organs and correct genetic flaws automatically. We also speak English with an idiosyncratic accent, which has survived for six centuries and was initiated and subsequently stylized in the social stratosphere by our designer, Dr. Sorsi Osa. As spokesperson for Cell City, I sense that our model will be obsolete within the course of the next master plan. I am trying to locate Dr. Sorsi Osa or anyone familiar with our model to help save us from replacement or decommission. I've received your sibilant telecommunications signal and hoped you would know Dr. Sorsi Osa's whereabouts.
1939. August 22nd, 1939. My dear Siegfried, I must say I'm writing you at last in a state of acute depression. The heat is fearful. I returned to town last night and the papers and the radio told me of a new Russian-German understanding. I wonder if you feel as sick about this today as I do. I had a nightmarish night thinking about it. Today I talk with quite a few people. Some of them think that the whole thing is a deal, that Chamberlain knew all about it, that it is inconceivable that the informed persons in England in the government did not know what was going on between Germany and Russia, that Chamberlain and those around him are glad to have this excuse to let down Poland as they let down Czechoslovakia. I'm only telling you what people say. One of them is a leading banker here. Whatever it is, it is horror for me. I hope by the time this letter reaches you that it will be revealed to be less sinister than it appears at this moment. By this time, I am sure you have had a letter from him, which will be, I hope, self-explanatory. He was brimming with delight and pride at the prospect of representing you, at the same time with many declarations that he could not take you away from anyone else unless you wanted it, and overwhelmed me with thanks for suggesting him to you. I spoke to him about the kind of sketches you might be interested to do, English types, etc., etc. He rose to that and asked if he could send to you the representative of a little magazine here called The Reader's Digest. I asked him what they pay. He said though it is a magazine chiefly of reprints, that for original material, quite short, they would pay as high as $1,500. This will, I hope, put the nation and Athenaeum in their place. not give Mr. Rose, I believe that is the name of the Reader's Digest man, a sense that he has the cholera or bubonic plague as you did Wolcott. I hope Hester will contrive some way of a meeting between you, perhaps through gauze or in a dark room and will not harass you too much. I wrenched my ankle so badly on the boat coming home that I am still wearing a bandage, but aside from that I had been as well as circumstances allow. I went to the country and showed the pictures to Elsa and to everybody. George has now a fairly large and enthusiastic public in this country. He could go from one country house to another, not as beautiful as Hatesbury perhaps, but with swimming pools and other more modern appliances and could marry any number of desirable girls, including the young daughter of Irving Berlin, who pawed him affectionately.
David stared at him long and intently and repeated without condescension the word baby several times. Elsa promptly went out and bought George an Indian costume, which I hope he has received by this time and perhaps even worn. The costume is, I am told, ferocious and has with it accessories, implements of warfare. But George's expression is so sweetly pacific, his general manner so serene and sunny and outgiving, that I somehow am not afraid that he will terrify you or his neighbors, even if he does wear it. I can't tell you what a wonderful memory it is for me to think of him and of my walks around Hatesbury. I have talked so much to Elsa about it that her expression grows wistful. Well, if we have peace, I will come to you, I hope, before it is too long. I've been with the Lunts in Wisconsin for quite a time, and I may do a play for them next year which will have music in it called The Pirate. I consented to do this because I simply cannot work on any idea of my own. Nothing seems good enough or of any importance whatever that one might see in the theater. Bob Sherwood tells me he has abandoned his new play also. Had I written this letter several days ago, I should have told you a good deal about the tone of feeling here. The identification of Roosevelt by his enemies with a decent foreign policy, and their consequent ambition to destroy that foreign policy, just as Lodge and Wilson's enemies kept us from joining the League of Nations because of their hatred of Wilson. But all of that seems academic in view of this new disaster. It is incredible that I should be writing you a political letter. I don't mean to do it, but we talk about nothing else here all day and all night. And if it were not that I don't want to delay writing you any longer, I should have chosen another day than today. I can't write any more now. I want you to know only that I am as alive as this inferno of heat will allow, and thinking of you and Hester and George.
I wanted to be with you every day. 